All right. We uh we could we thumbs up here, Michelle. Here we go. Yep, let's get going. All right. Well, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone from all over the world. Um, it's great to have you. We are um, looking forward to this discussion. It's uh it's great to have so many people from all over the world just looking at this uh, this panel and our and our panelists are pretty psyched to do this. So um, let me just tell. Well, first, let me introduce yourself. My name is Mark. Myself. My name is Mark Duclo. Uh, I am with um, Century Commercial out of Hartford, Connecticut. I am an SIOR, a CRE, Council of Real Estate, and also an FRICS. So uh, I've got all the initials behind my name. But uh, it's great to be able to moderate this great panel and uh, look forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about office and uh, industrial real estate. Obviously, it's a big world out there, so we can't cover all the different areas geographically, but we can give you a, kind of an idea of what our panelists are seeing in their markets and maybe try to spread it out a little bit to the bigger markets. Um, and we're going to tell you kind of where we're headed, not just where we're at, but where we're headed and all the different factors that that kind of uh, come into play when uh, when we're talking about industrial and office real estate. Let me tell you what we're not going to talk about. We're not going to talk about the supply chain as it relates to just the supply chain. There's plenty of supply chain experts out there. So things like those subjects, we're going to reference the supply chain, but we're going to reference the supply chain as it affects real estate. We're not going to talk about when office workers are going to get back to the office or will they ever? I mean, we're going to talk about the, how those decisions they uh, affect real estate and, um, you know, and, and, and your markets, but not necessarily the opinion. So we're not doing predictions here. We're doing things that we actually see happening. And hopefully you could take that as take home value and, and put it in your, in your, uh, your day's work. Um, hope the next, uh, next hour will let you understand a little bit more about our markets and what we deal with every day. So a couple of um, housekeeping items. I think you've probably already been told this, but we might not have time for Q&A. You've got a uh, chat or a question um, uh, function in this uh, Zoom. So please use that. You see Michelle there. He is going to be responsible for monitoring those. And we're probably going to pick up on a few of those questions and try to work those in, the, um, in our conversations. Um, try to keep it light. So before we get this thing going, you know, big smile and big deep breath, because I know we can all use one. We can, it's been a, it's been a grind, it's, even if it's been a, a good couple of years from a business standpoint, there's definitely been a lot of stress and there's de definitely been a grind. So smile, relax, and uh, take a deep breath. So with that, I said, we had a great, we have a great panel. So I want to introduce the panel and then I'm going to give them the opportunity to say a couple of things about them before we get going. So first uh, we've got Bill Yokopina. Uh, Bill is the managing director. He's a CRE. Uh, he is a managing director of Coldwell Banker in Pasadena, California. Uh, Dan Palmieri, who is also an SIOR, uh, Senior Director of Cushman and Wakefield in Las Vegas. Uh, we have Damian Rivera, who's an SIOR and a partner in ESRP, which is, uh, and he's out of Dallas, Texas. And we've got Haygood Morrison, who's a CRE and an SIOR, and he's the Executive Vice President at Bridge Commercial in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So we got a little bit uh, all over the map. I'm out of Connecticut, so I think we're covering the map, maybe not the you know, the Minnesota area and that, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. So uh, let's start off. Bill, give us a little bit about yourself and take it from there. Thank you, Mark. Bill Ucrapina, Coal Banker Commercial in Pasadena, California. We expect 90 degree weather today, so please send us your rain. We really need it. After college graduation, I worked for about four years at Xerox selling copiers, then briefly went to work for William D. Feldman Associates for three and a half years. Bill was a very successful real estate developer, broker, and investor. I then spent 22 years at CBRE in both sales and management, mainly office building sales and leasing. I then turned 50 and wanted to start my own company. So I opened a Coal Banker commercial franchise, got up to 30 employees, did that 11 years, then sold the Colliers in 2017. Now I'm back with Coal Banker Commercial in Pasadena, California. I have four people that work for me full time. We mainly do owner, user, offers, office brokerage in the greater Pasadena, California area, which is 11 miles from downtown LA. We are finding the buy sale market very strong. We're finding office vacancy going up profusely in high rise office buildings. And we'll address how to lease these buildings and how to get people back to work during our seminar. 
Excellent. So when we were asked how many years we've been in the business, uh, we can all just say long enough to know. So uh, yeah. the, 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 that's an example of that. So Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Dan Palmieri with Cushman Wakefield in Las Vegas, uh, going on 15 years in the business. Uh, my story, a little different. High school drop, excuse me, college dropout, not high school. I finished high school, but grew up in the restaurant business and uh, had an entrepreneurial dad told me uh, nobody's going to give you anything. And if you work harder than everyone else, you'll figure it out. So followed that route, but wanted to find a career that had weekends and holidays off. Lo and behold, a few of our customers were commercial real estate guys, asked them what they did, figured out how to get into it, uh, started in apartments. The market crashed, big recession. Uh, one of the guys said, nobody's going to buy an apartment for about three years. So uh, uh, a fellow SIR, Tabor Phil, just started doing 10 a rep, asked him if he needed help and ran with it. That's going on, you know, 13 years now. Uh, moved to Cushman just shy of 10 years ago. Uh, I'm the only guy in Vegas that does exclusive tenor rep at a big firm and uh, now lead a four person team. So we're having a lot of fun. And then uh, obviously Vegas, everyone knows it globally uh, as the gambling and entertainment capital of the world. But as of recent, we are shifting strongly to the sports capital of the world with Golden Knights, the Raiders announcing a ton of big companies follow suit now that they're looking at Las Vegas with not the, the old stigma of a gambling town. So uh, very bullish on our market for the next five, 10 years and uh, excited to share our thoughts with everyone as well. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. I think in our preliminary call, I think uh, we grabbed Dan and said when he comes back in a second life, he wants to come back as an industrial broker. Come on, admit it, admit it. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm, I'm still mad at the guys at Collier's that stirred, you know, steered me towards office. Uh, I, I still give them a little heat today. So, <laughs> Damien, Dallas, Texas. Yes, sir. So welcome. Yeah, my name is Damien Rivera. I'm based here in Dallas, Fort Worth, our headquarters for ESRP, which is a company that we launched eight years ago. Uh, we joke, for those of you that are familiar with American football, uh, we joke that it stands for ex Staubach Real Estate Partners um, because half of our company worked for Roger for about 15 years. And uh, so when the Staubach company went away, we, we decided to uh, start the Staubach company 2.0. So we did eight years ago. Uh, ironically, our headquarters is in the headquarters of the Dallas Cowboys here on the north side of DFW. And um, yeah, and so I 100%, we're a 100% tenant rep only company, just like Roger Staubach uh, had for many, for 30 years or so until the JLL acquisition. And um, we, uh, I'm actually a SIOR with a dual designation. So 50% of what I do is on the office side, and 50% of what I do is on the industrial side. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to, uh, to the discussion. Nice, nice. And if you, if Damien uh, did, had, didn't have to use the uh, CRE SIOR screen there, you would actually see a picture of the uh, Dallas Cowboys practice facility behind him. So yeah, it's hiding back there. So yeah, always an impressive sight. Thanks, Damien. Hey, good. Tell Hello. us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. I'm Hey Good Morrison. I live and work here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm fortunate to have my 33 year old son working with me here. So that's been a blessing. Uh, I, I specialize in industrial brokerage, which I've kind of learned from my experience being on the waterfront. I was in the Navy for, for about five years and worked for a waterfront contractor for a little bit after that, and then been involved with industrial brokerage and logistics brokerage in the Southeast for, uh, for a number of years. I enjoyed working with one of the larger firms for prior to our forming Bridge Commercial, which we did so in uh, three years ago. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun. Our, our market is a, is, is a great market. Charleston, as you know, is often voted the most beautiful city in the country. We have a lot of manufacturing and distribution here with, with golly, with the Boeing 787 plant, the Mercedes Sprinter van plant, and of course, the Volvo SC90 plant. So we, we kind of, uh, we, we, we have a lot going on here um, and our port, the deepest port on the East Coast. So we're, we're, we're tapping on all eight cylinders and I'm glad to be on the panel. Thank you, Mark. Uh, absolutely. We actually, CRE was and uh, councils were in uh, Charleston just, what was it? Seems like ancient, you, you know, was that three or four years ago? I guess we're in Charleston. Was, yeah. yeah. Now, who was your, who was your uh, 
economic development guy that that spoke there. I mean, he's a hoot, and he's not economic development anymore, I don't think. But it's like Billy Bob or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike Graney was it Mike Graney? No, no, Mike? Mike's there now, right? This guy, yeah, was, Mike Graney. Yeah, this he's guy, great. I forget his name, but uh, this guy was uh, he carried around a shotgun on the back of his uh, truck, and uh, he. He was uh, he he was a hoot to listen to, so a lot of fun. Yeah, so. yeah, that's not uncommon. You are in the south here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, we don't want to know the temperature. I want to know the, the humidity uh, percentage right now. But uh, anyway, we'll move on. Um, so listen, uh, we're going to start off with office, and we're going to try to morph this back and forth if possible. We're going to let let it kind of take shape. So we're going to start off with the effect of labor on real estate. Um, and it's affected labor in very different, I mean, both piece, both parts of real estate, what I call the two food groups, it's affected office in a very different way than it's affected industrial. We're gonna start off with the office side and talk about employees. I mean, we all talk about the work from home hybrid or traditional work. Um, there's nothing we can do to, uh, you know, to, to change, I guess, what the ultimate outcome, whether we're going to be a hybrid workforce or not. So again, we're not going to go on predictions, but maybe you guys could tell us, Dan or Bill, you jump in, tell us a little bit about how employees are driving companies' decisions and what they do. And of course, how that is affecting your markets. And we could just say to your markets. Bill, you want to take Bill. it? Bill? Yeah. Sure. Uh a lot of companies we talk to in the greater Pasadena area, especially the executives and leaders, want their employees to come back to the office. We are finding that it's very difficult to get administrative employees doing processing, invoices, et cetera, to come back to the office if they have more than a 30-minute drive and they're driving their car. We're finding that employees are coming back who live near the office. Uh, some of the things that I'm finding companies are doing to get their employees to come back, get their labor back, is offering a flex schedule of the following, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. They're allowing their administrative employees and others to get in Monday at 10 a.m. because nobody wants to get up at 5 a.m. after a weekend. Tuesday is a full day of regular work. They're off Wednesday, back Thursday for a full day, and then they need the three-day weekend. Uh, companies and buildings to draw people back are, acts, are uh, offering flex hours for employees, meaning they want, if they're going to come in the morning at 6 a.m. and leave at 2 or come in at 10 and leave at 6, they want the building to be open, they want proper lighting, they want security, they want access. Another thing we're finding companies are doing to draw people back and buildings is to offer reserved and free parking spaces. Employees like the little things. Another little thing companies are offering, you walk in in the morning, you check off what you want for lunch and the lunch is delivered to your office. Um, we're finding companies are drawing employees back by having 20, 25 minute meetings Monday morning as a collaboration meeting since they're only coming in two or three days a week. They're offering the best technology, they're offering large computer monitors and we're really finding that employees don't want to be on a long table like a sewing factory. They want their space. They want their privacy. And the companies that are doing that, offering daycare, some are offering local health club memberships, discounts at local retailers. They're offering the little things to, to excite employees to come back to the office. And it appears to be working. So that so that's from the employee standpoint, which is great. And Dan, you can add to that or disagree or agree. But then the next thing would be, what's how's that affecting the landlords? Because Bill, you just started talking about the change in space. Of course, a landlord plays a little bit into that. That and and so, if you can take, what's the effect of real estate on that, Dan? What you're seeing in Vegas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so what we're seeing is the old traditional buildings are losing out, right? And as those leases come up, and we're now in you know year two of this. Um, you know, it's, we're seeing a lot of leases roll. And, and during the first stage of, of this, you know, past two years, we were seeing our clients kick the can down the road. And now they're taking a harder look at moving the, the nicer stuff, right? We're working on a deal right now where it's a full floor tenant and we're literally moving them just two buildings over because they want their employees to have a new fresh place when they come back to work, right? I mean, full floor, it's a basically the same layout but they want it to be exciting for these people. And so they're all fighting for 
the very little talent pool out there because of the, you know, the amount of people just not wanting to go back to work right now that it's really affecting the landlords and their amenities within the project, uh, you know, especially these mixed use projects where you have coffee shops and other supporting services that are there purely because of the daily traffic these office buildings bring in the way of employees, they're really struggling. So we're seeing a, a, what we're seeing is a big movement, especially the bigger national companies are doing 10 year leases and they're doing them in the most expensive real estate we have, all the new stuff being built in the hopes of attracting and retaining that talent. I think we saw that conversation happening for a good decade prior to COVID, right? Everyone wants the mixed use. It's about the attraction and, and retainment of their talent. That's been magnified, I'd say tenfold now. It's such a competitive marketplace. And ultimately, if I'm new and out of college and I am going to go to work at an office and it's the same pay and it's the same business, I'm going where the cool place is, right? I want to go have fun where I go work. And how's that affect, how's that, give us an example, maybe how that affects, uh, get, I mean, give us an idea, a landlord, maybe what, what's the increase they've got to put in TIs versus the, the, their return on their, on their lease, what their lease rate is. Well, it's, it's astronomical right now. Yeah. You know, we're seeing landlords, especially the ones that need the tenant are buying the deals, you know, and, and maybe getting a return in the last year, year and a half of that lease term just to put in and the construction costs haven't helped anything, you know? So, uh, you know, what uh, we've seen them get so high here locally that it's killed a couple deals, you know, it's a, a lot of value engineering happening or, what we didn't experience a, a lot previously is our clients coming out of pocket. Not only are they coming out of pocket, but they're coming out of pocket a big amount. So we're having to amortize that or trade that free rent we've negotiated for to cover the Delta. But ultimately it's because they're trying to build out space that's unlike their competitor space. So give me, give me an idea. And I'm going to shift over to you, Bill, uh, for the same question. Give me an idea of what a lease rate class, a 10 year net effective lease rate looks like. And, uh, and obviously there's a range, so they're not giving away trade secrets here. And, and what that was pre-COVID and then the same thing, TIs. What was the TIs pre-COVID and what are they today? Yeah, on the newest Class A stuff we're seeing, you know, on a net effective over to 10-year deal, you're, you're in Vegas, we do everything on a monthly, but you're probably around four bucks full service, which is astronomical for Vegas, right? And Clarify, clarify what that $4 means to, to everybody so, out there. Yeah. $4 full service gross, that's all in or $48 annually, right? So that's going to be your, your base rent, your cams, janitorial and electrical services. On top of that, you're going to have your parking charges. We're still seeing landlords give abatements on that, but not quite as much. The TI amounts, so pre-COVID in our market, you know, from Shell, you could get a space done pretty well for 70 to 80 bucks. If you wanted to spend 100, it was going to be top in market. We're now seeing... The stuff that was 70 or 80 coming at 110 and 120. And if you want the real nice stuff, we just got a bid the other day for a big national client. We're just shy of $200 a foot. But the rental rates haven't changed enough to justify that, right? Not even close. We've just seen locally rental rates bumping up over about the last four to five months. And they're bumping up 8%. You know, that's 8%. not enough. To, yeah, that's not enough to cover that delta. My eye. Absolutely. In, Bill, in, tell us a little bit about Pasadena, and then uh, sure. Damon, I'm, I'm kind of interested in Dallas here too. Yeah, you bet. In, in the greater Pasadena area, pre-COVID, we were seeing rates up at three fifty per square foot per month, full service, which is roughly forty two dollars a year and up. And post-COVID, now with a much higher office vacancy, we're way down to high twos or low threes per month, meaning thirty two to thirty six dollars. Landlords are spending more money on TIs to try to refit the space for. The, the post can pandemic user, I, I agree with uh, Dan that it's a great time for a lot of tenants now to upgrade their space, to upgrade their environment, to keep their employees. I also agree that TI costs are really high. I am seeing a lot of landlords go to tenants and renewing them short term to keep them in the space. They don't want any more vacancy. So they're offering a one or two year renewal. Hopefully the market will improve in two or three years and therefore they keep the rent. Kick, kick the can, kick the can. So uh, and then when you guys start talking about 350 and four bucks, if you're in Connecticut, you're like, wow, I'm moving to Vegas because of course we quote annual numbers, not, uh, not uh, <laughs> <laughs> Damon, Texas, Dallas. Yeah. So it's great. Um, 
so it's interesting in, in DFW, kind of what Dan was saying, DFW is interesting. So if you've got a class A or double class A building, there hasn't been any real compression at all on rental rates. Um, there has been, there has been additional concessions made for TIs, as Dan pointed out, right? Because the tenant improvement, the construction on these buildings um, have gone up significantly, as Dan pointed out. Um, however, the buildings that we feel and that we are seeing are in trouble here locally in Texas are your B. I would not want to own some C, C plus buildings, some B minus buildings, would not want to own those, wouldn't touch them uh, with a 10 foot pole. Uh, those are the buildings that are going to struggle for sure and that are struggling for sure. But the class A, the money that owns those buildings, as some of you uh, that are on this uh, understand, because you are the money for some of those buildings. Um, it's very patient money and it's, it's willing to wait. And, and I think most of us have recognized that it's been said multiple times that there's a flight to quality, right? For class A and for good product, because if you're going to have a product that people are, that you're going to want to get people to come back to, it better be nice. I, I can't be in a dungeon with no windows and convince people to bring their microwave lunch and sit there and not see daylight until they, uh, until they walk out and get five minutes of it in their windshield and the car ride home. So, uh, so that's been really interesting here. So I don't know if I missed it while I was taking a note, but what would it, what would a class A, you know, top of the line building uh, in uh, Dallas uh, rent for net effective five years call it? Yeah. So, so you're, you're now, so our, our high end rents here in Dallas gross on an annual basis will get you in the low $60 a foot range. Right. Um, so if you did a 10 year deal in one of those buildings today, you know, you probably would get somewhere between six and 10 months of free rent. Um, and, uh, and where you're going to see the biggest concession is really going to be on your, on your TIs. Yeah. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Um, T TIs have gone up for sure. You know, 30 to 50% as far as the allowances are concerned. How much do you think that is uh, because of the increase in cost of construction? Is that half all, of it? All, yeah. 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 All, all, you know, all inflation driven, right. Yeah. Just yeah. And, and supply driven. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so the other thing I wanted to piggyback on, Mark, just too, yeah, right. is, oh. is um, you know, so I, I just want to give you guys kind of a data point. So for, for, for two things, one, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Apple and you're talking about how are these folks getting people back to work and what are they doing? You know, um, so, you know, there's a big, if you guys follow the news, there's a lot of tension right now with Apple. You know, the executive team and Tim Cook and his executive team have told all Apple employees, you are coming back to the office, period, end of story. Um, and, that, and that is for every, virtually every one of their employees. There is a group of their employees who are pushing back on that. And they're saying, wait a minute, we don't wanna come back. And so there are letters that are going back and forth between Tim Cook and the leadership team at Apple and, their, and, and a certain groups of their employees who are, who are loving the fact that they can work from home, make the same money and not have to commute. And Apple's saying, no, you're coming back, period. We're a creative company. You know, we are the leaders in thought and in ingenuity and creativity. And, and, and there's no way that you guys are staying home. You girls are staying home. So very, very interesting. So what, what do we think? And I'm, it's outside of my field. Does anybody know what Apple leases, uh, how many square feet they've got throughout the country, the world? Any idea? I, I don't, but their new yeah. campus, obviously, that they just built. And if you haven't seen, Google the new Apple HQ campus that looks like a big, you know, round spaceship. Um, yeah. is, is, is pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm curious so if, if uh, you know, I'd be curious to see what that effect is on vacancy, you know, in, in the market, you know, in that space. Because, you know, if it's what is 25 percent, if 25 percent of the employees win that battle. Right. What does that what does that effectively mean for vacant mm -hmm. space at that new that new facility? And just one last one before we move to Higgard. So in your markets, how many um, g give a estimate because they're all over the board. But how much how what's the percentage of people back in Pasadena or Vegas or Dallas? What, how many how many are so, people? So are I'll stick with Dallas. So Dallas and Houston lead the United States and people badging back in. So we're just over. 50% today. Okay. And we lead, we lead the United States in that effort. Does Dallas yeah. and Houston, does Dallas and Houston, do they know for pre COVID or post COVID? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm moving on. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear you. Sorry, <laughs> but I'm sure it was funny. Yeah, yeah. No, I said, does Dallas and Houston know for pre COVID or post COVID yet? I mean, it's a, uh, no, no, no. Little, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're what, what's coming? <laughs> well, moving on, exactly. Dan, what do you got? <laughs> uh, and, and the bigger office projects in town, they're tracking in the high 30% range right now. I mean, but it's company specific. I, I know our office, we're, we're close to 100, you know, and just about everybody's showing up. So um, what's, your, what's your total market? What's a Vegas total market for, uh, for office baseball park? Uh, depends who you ask, but you're roughly in the 42 to 45 million square feet. So you got 12 million, uh, 13, you got 12, 14, 15 million square feet occupied out of 42 million square feet. Yeah. But with that, because we, we don't have a big tenants here, like we do in the, you know, bigger markets, uh, you know, Dallas, San Francisco, LA, we weren't hit quite as drastically with the big subleases mm-hmm. coming to the market. So we, the, the landlords didn't feel it quite as much. Got it. Got it. And one last, uh, you Bill, what do you, what do you seen over in Pasadena? Last summer, Mark, we were at about a third and the Chamber of Commerce and other activists are hoping to get that up to 45, 50 percent by the end of the year. I am seeing companies coming back to work. Certainly traffic reflects it. And what's the size of your market? Uh, Pasadena is about 9.3 million feet. My total market is about 12 million, Pasadena, Arcadia, Monrovia. All right. So you've got uh, so you've got um, uh, hello. Uh, about uh, 4,000, 4, 4 million square feet uh, occupied right now is what you're saying. Four or five million right. square feet. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, good. Thanks for being patient, buddy. Uh, the, uh, oh. So let's talk about labor on the industrial side. Um, obviously, labor is a huge issue. We've heard, uh, I've heard rumors where Amazon has slowed down uh, their development and their uh, takedowns of uh, facilities because of challenges with labor, construction costs, getting sprinter uh, vehicles. Um, I think the other one was material handling equipment is going up through the roof, but let's, but I think the big one is, you know, the average, I think what I heard, and this may or may not be right, is something like 800 people for a facility, they're getting like 400. And Mm -hmm. so labor becomes a real issue. Tell us a little bit about how labor has positively, because I think in your market, I think it's positively affected uh, real estate decisions, but how labor affects real estate decisions in the industrial world. Yeah, thank you. It, uh, and that's, I've heard the same thing about Amazon, that they, if they're citing a facility and they have questions about the labor, they'll hold off on building the facility unless, until they're sure they have the labor. In many of the Southeast, you know, we have strong net in migration. So we have a, a, a growing pipeline of labor, but nonetheless, it, it's a big problem. I, I just, I've noticed the trucking companies tending to, try to pay a dollar more than the guy next door. Uh, and I'm not sure how long that's gonna work out. But the manufacturing companies and distribution companies are becoming much more creative. And they're doing things to, to really look at the personal situations of their employees in order to retain those employees. And that, uh, that could vary from one employee to the next. And um, this, is, this is no joke, I know of a company about 100 miles from here, who's uh, decided to uh, take the two, first two days of deer season off because most people weren't showing up anyway. So uh, they decided to take it off. But again, it, it, every company is going to be different, but they're looking at the personal situation of those employees. And then uh, they're trying to, companies are trying to find ways to brand their company and, be, and, and make sure their employees absorb and understand and appreciate the brand. Uh, and that's that's big. I mean, if you're a, a logistics company with 200 um, clients, how do you brand that company? Uh, it's easy if you're a manufacturer. You know, if you build drivetrains for a Mercedes van, Mercedes van, for instance, you can train people about what the drivetrain does, show them that it goes into a Mercedes van plant, say, you know, show them that the DHL and Amazon just bought 10,000 of these vehicles. So this is these vehicles and what you do is what gets goods and services and, and items to your door every day. So it's a little bit easier on the manufacturing side, but the folks I'm talking to are trying to be creative and developing a free to core and camaraderie by everyone taking pride in their company. So, so you, you know, other yeah. than that, you're kind of back to flexible work hours, fitness programs, less restrictive job requirements. And that sort of thing. Well, tell us, thank you. So tell us a little bit about Charleston, right? So Charleston has had all these wins with Volvos of the world, right? Um, you got the you got the Boeing, uh, is it, the, I always forget the name, Dreamliner? Right? Yeah. So all the Dreamliners are, are, that's right. All, all being made out in Charleston now? 
right? 787 is. Uh, the, are you, the 787 is. Okay, thank you. So you're seeing um, what always amazes me, you know, it used to be companies move for cost, right? You'd move for cost. And a big thing in Connecticut was you'd move down to, to, uh, to the Southeast because it would be, it's cheaper. It's a, it's a right to, uh, it's a right to work state and yada, yada, yada. Right. But now, and, and, and everybody says, well, you know, X, Y, Z company moved down Southeast. So that's eh, okay. You only lost X amount of jobs, but you say, well, what about all the jobs that follow that to follow that particular talent? Right. So now companies really don't move necessarily for costs. That's part of it. But they're really following talent. Right. So you guys are actually a, a poster child for that. Right. Because now you got the Dreamliner. Then have you seen um, other real estate being absorbed and built be strictly because of the Dreamliner? I know we didn't talk about this in our preliminary, but I'm just thinking about it. Right. You, you've got to be seeing that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a best of class company. It's glamorous. I mean, the planes lined up on the runway at the airport are painted with these different schemes for every customer. It, it's, it's fantastic. And of course, that attracts people. Yeah, I think this particular region has the highest, uh, what they track is the factor of net in, my, in, in migration as a function of total population. And areas around the Southeast, Charleston is one of the top ones in the country. So we continually to see people uh, moving here. Also, uh, it helps if you're in a community that has a military base, Jacksonville, for instance. Uh, often these companies will, uh, an E5 or E6, retires after 20 years. Hell, he's only 38 years old right. and he doesn't want to leave. Uh, so he picks up a job at 38, 39, 40. So that's also been a good feeder for companies like this. And you, you referred to it and it's the same old thing. A right to work state. I mean, South Carolina has the second lowest union penetration in the country. That is a that's a big deal, uh, and when it comes down to convincing employers to come to this to this region, so that that helps a lot. Uh, and then you're kind of left with incentives. Um, there's been sort of a flattening, I think, of incentives in the southeast. Some of my uh, tax lawyer friends would disagree with me, but it, it there's a handful of incentives. Fee in lieu of taxes, for instance, is the main one that. Um, that attracts folks, but you know, that's not going to drive it entirely here. It's all the other softer factors. So, so that, but the, the, I guess the, uh, the, the, the one question real quick, just uh, are yes or no, are you seeing suppliers locate because of the 777, 7, uh, uh, 27, 777 decision? 787. 787, so thank you. I'll get my planes right. I'm on them long enough. I should know. Them. Yeah, yeah. So, so Boeing prides itself in having a very disparate supply chain. Uh, there's an interesting diagram which shows where each part comes from, and they come from all over the world. So when it comes to Boeing, we have QA centers. A part will come in, it'll go through a QA center, be checked, and then go to Boeing plant. Really the auto companies, uh, Mercedes vans, BMW up in Greenville, and the Volvo plant here, those really attract lots of tier two and two tier three suppliers. And frankly, that's how a lot of us make our money is is on those particular type companies so you you named it you said supply chain let's stay on the industrial side a little bit everybody's heard about the supply chain um ad nauseum uh, i'm not suggesting that they shouldn't have because there are some major major issues with the supply chain although we we're listening to a speaker at siwr and i think if i remember uh, him correctly he was basically saying actually the supply chain in many ways is working better than it ever has it's just it's we got a consumption issue that's off the charts so we got just you know people that just just are consuming left and right. And he's not suggesting there aren't any challenges to the supply chain, but he's also saying, hey, listen, we just got insatiable consumerism right now. Uh, how are companies, and Damien, you can jump in here. How are companies adjusting what they're doing uh, for real estate decisions because of the challenges of the supply chain? Yeah. So I'll tell you. Go ahead, Damien. Um, so, you know, we are really, you know, Mark, we're really, um, you know, we're a commercial real estate company, but really we're a data and analytics company that ultimately help people with their real estate. Um, but you got to have the data, right? And so the, the, what drives real estate decisions, as everybody knows, is labor and, and your transportation costs, right? Your real estate costs are five to 8% of your overall spend. It's, it's, a, it's, it's really not a big deal at the end of the day. Um, you know, if your rates are, are, are seven bucks net for a bulk industrial space and they go up to nine, 
Uh, is that going to be frustrating? Is that going to, you're going to feel it for sure. Um, but, but basically you straight line that rent when you do a 10 year lease and it pretty much stays the same every year for 10 years. Um, what's, what's hurting people and companies right now, obviously is the labor and what's really hurting folks and what's really hurting companies is they're making decisions very one dimensionally. They're looking at a market and they're saying, Hey, I want to pay 15 bucks an hour. And so I'm going to go to Atlanta because Atlanta has got a lot of industrial space. And this PDF, the 77 page PDF that, that my real estate provider sent me says that I can pay 15 bucks an hour and I'll be okay. Um, but here's the issue with that. The issue with that is that um, there's something called the MIT living wage calculator. And if you're not familiar with it, Google it. It looks at, and this is for us, it, they, MIT every quarter evaluates what it costs for you to buy a jar of peanut butter, gallon of gas, a loaf of bread, right? And they, they will look at your market and they'll tell you what does it cost to get by? Not to do well, not to get by well, but just what does it cost to just not die, right? <laughs> um, where I am today, where I'm standing within a 30 minute drive time from where I'm presenting in DFW, it costs $15 and 21 cents an hour for you not to die. Okay. So per hour. So what happens though, is that when companies look at these, that, that increase we saw from Q4 to Q1 of 2021, just in Atlanta alone, I'll pick on Atlanta. There was a 26% increase in the living wage of what it costs to live in Atlanta in Q1 versus what the data was showing in Q4. So guess what? If you are listening to this and you chose to move to Atlanta last year and put a big facility, I will guarantee you, you're having some of the biggest attrition issues you've ever had because Atlanta just alone jumped 26%. And so you've got to get ahead of that. You've got to really start doing some predictive analytics. You got to start looking at where are we going from an inflation standpoint? What are wages predicted to be? What type of competition is looking to come there? You got to start really factoring all of that if you're making real estate decisions today, because your labor will absolutely, as everybody knows, will destroy you. Totally, totally. But you're seeing you're seeing major growth in the Dallas area. Um, I mean, what what, what can you? Right. And so you just gave a lot of uh, stuff on reasons to make those decisions. What's driving that market? If you could pick one thing, what is driving that market? Um, in Dallas specifically? Dallas specifically. Yeah. Well, look, no corporate income tax, right? So give yourself an 11 to 13% raise. Yeah. You know, at the corporate level, your, your folks don't pay any state income tax. Yeah. So give all of your employees um, yeah. a raise, 11 to 13%. Okay. Uh, maybe higher if you're in California. Um, a right to work state, not have to worry about unions. So that's what's driving all of that business here. Um, there's obviously tons of divide on so many different issues today, um, but Texas has been the beneficiary. So is Florida and some other markets where they have said, hey, look, you do what you want to do, um, but we're not going to force that upon you. And so, so that's been more interesting and attractive and appealing to, to uh, some companies more than others. And today Dallas has a billion square feet of industrial space and just over 400 million square feet of office space. And, um, and, and this is another fascinating front on the industrial side. This year, on average, Dallas will deliver about four, 13, 14 million square feet a year of industrial space. Demand has gone so far um, that this year we'll deliver 40 million square feet of space and absorb 40 million square feet. So. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, to that note, to that note, they're saying of all the new construction out in the marketplace, whether you call it spec, uh, what, what, what I guess we'll call spec development, 70% throughout the country is already spoken for. That's already leased, right? And they, we're talking about a logistics, actually, Prologis. We thought it was going to happen next year. Prologis just came out with the numbers that said that we actually have a logistics vacancy rate of less than 4% right now. So it's the first time ever in the country we're under 4%. So with that, hey, good. And then I'm going to go back to the office market and talk about the what um, what a loser building looks like and what the heck do you do with it. Um, but uh, first, I do want to I do want to go to the industrial side. Say, hey, good. Supply chain. You're a port city. 
Um, everybody knows about ports, even if they didn't uh, know beforehand, they know about them now. What are real estate, what are companies doing from a real estate perspective to offset the challenges of being jammed up in ports. Uh, I forget the I forget the web website that you can look at uh, and and see. Yeah. The, was it marine.com or something like that? It is. It is. I mean, yeah. the, the the acronym to come up for that is how do you reduce the point of pain in this? And yeah. and and the supply chains are getting much more creative and much wider, if you will. Um, uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern and the public railways here are very busy trying to put up and uh, uh, trying to encourage folks like ourselves to put, build, build, build rail serve buildings that are outside of um, main population centers. The idea is that it obviously gets trucks off the road. You know those numbers in terms of reliability and fuel uh, efficiency. Uh, and, and then it, it's the goods you might be in Macon instead of in Atlanta. And then they can be taken out, transloaded to the, to the uh, near city distribution centers in Atlanta. So there's a big push to try to get containers on a rail and out of these port cities. That's one. Uh, Transloads facilities. Uh, in, in, so tell us what that is. Tell us for, for the population. Yeah, a transload facility, is a, it, they've been around a long time, but they've always been centered right at a port terminal. And it's basically a facility that's long and skinny. It usually has about a hundred doors and, um, and, it, and it usually has a, a uh, good bit of land on both sides, and it, usually about eight times that in parking in okay. addition to doors. Yep. The idea is to get the container and the to, uh, up to one side, get the goods out, and put that those goods into a 53 foot van, which has 30 percent more capacity. To, and by doing that, you get the container and the chassis back to the port. Now those used to be placed right at the terminal. Now we're seeing them right outside the terminal, and then in you know within 10 or 15 or 20 miles of the terminal. So the idea is get that, you know, there's a shortage of containers and chassis, get all that equipment back to steam sh steamship lines, get the goods into a 53 foot van and over the road for as far as they need to go. So it, it, industrial brokers ought to be looking to site those, those uh, transload facilities, they can do it. Which, which the change there is that they're right there at the ports? Generally, that's the yep. best option because yep. uh, there's, there's no, what they call inbound dray number. But the point is to have it close enough so you get the, the, the working equipment back to the steamship lines, the chassis, which break down by the way, and the, uh, and the container and get it into a higher capacity, long trip vehicle, which yeah. is represented by these 53 foot dry vans that you see. So that's the idea is, yeah. um, and that's the concept, very efficient. And they, uh, they don't rent like, you know, they rent really by the door, not really by the square footage. So it's an interesting, oh, it's interesting. An interesting paradigm, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot more also of the uh, near ports of the investment into small truck yards. So institutional money is going into these truck yards, eight to 15 acres. Uh, and there's several of them. Uh, Industrial Outdoor Ventures is one that I deal with. And they buy these mom and pop truck yards, which we used to go from one mom and pop company to another. Now they're buying it, improving it, using it for, for, for trucking purposes, but also for storage, lay down and storage of all kinds of different things, uh, building supplies, roofing yep. materials and whatnot. So uh, that's a that's a new ripple in the market that we're seeing near ports within 15 or 20 miles of ports. Great, and, and I think you know we talked about thank you. We're talking about the broken supply chain or the efficient uh, but not uh, efficient enough supply chain. We're also hearing things like air cargo is starting to pick up now. So air cargo facilities are starting to bulk up a little bit. I also though heard from a good buddy of mine who uh, does a lot of uh, this type of uh, logistics, and he said actually air cargo is really starting to back up right now. Um, you know we were filling planes. With, uh, with cargo, of course, now we're filling people with cargoes. And so that's starting to squeeze out the cargo. So you're starting to see facilities built right at um, the uh, at the airports and such. So there's a whole evolution of that on the real estate side and where you take advantage, right? So more stuff at the, uh, at the ports, more stuff at the airports um, where you're seeing maybe these, um, these uh, the squeeze. Let's talk about office space again. Let's talk about, we, we mentioned um, what you do wanna own, and what and we referenced it. So Dan, Bill, tell us, tell us just quickly what do you want to own in your markets? Give us that picture, and then we're going to talk about what don't you want to own and if, what you want to do, if, what you need to do with it. So quickly, what do you want to own? 
Bill. Uh, in Las Vegas. Oh, go, oh, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Thank That's God. Fine. Yeah. yeah, so in, in Las Vegas, uh, again, it's going back to that flight to quality, especially when we're talking about the larger tenants. You know, it's the older product in less desirable neighborhoods that's really going to struggle. Um, you know, so, unless it's just a, a low budget company looking for that type of space. So it's close, it's, it's a multi story uh, towers, right? They're class A yeah. towers. All right. Do they have to yeah. be multi story? Can they be two, two story, just beautiful two story yeah. buildings? Yeah, we're not a market full of large buildings. Our largest office buildings are 17 stories, and we only have two of them. So anytime I go to a big market, I, you know, just give me one of those. I, I would drill all day. So, you know, but but that being said, our traditional CBDs of downtown and a little bit east of the Strip, which was always the center of town, are, are fallen by the wayside as Las Vegas has grown outwards, right? Uh, I think the one difference in Vegas is we've hit, we've hit the, the limit. We're at the end of the island, if you will. We're surrounded by government land on all sides. So we're, we're kind of there. So I think in the next 20 years, we'll start to see some infill and gentrification of these older products that aren't performing well. And uh, what's interesting is we've been talking to the Prologises and the Panatonis of the world, and they're saying, hey, if you find an office product that's underperforming or just not doing well, but still has some income in it, we'll take a look at that. We're happy to hold on to something like that for five years with a little bit of income, knowing there's no future land down the road. So that's a that's a, a new twist to what we've been seeing, you know, and then uh, it's really, yeah, what does that mixed use look like? How do I attract that, that tenant base? How does my client or my tenant attract their employee? It's all about those amenities. So, so Bill, what, what in your market, what's, is, that, is, is that the same thing or is it a little different? Well, the owners that are winning in the Pasadena, California area, they're keeping up their common areas, the ingress and egress, the security, the retail amenities, and they're the two to four story buildings, frankly. The buildings that are really getting hit is they're not keeping the curb appeal, the common areas, the lobby, the security, all those basic things they're not doing, but it's especially the high rises. As we get into a hybrid workplace, people coming one, two, three days a week, they want that easy access early morning, late in the afternoon security. And I agree with all the comments, tenants are definitely upgrading their space now with lower rates and able to attract more people because of that. But what's the building? So that so there's an idea there. So it, listen, you can only a dog is a dog, right? You can't change a dog, right? So you, you can make it's the, dog the old stuff. Better. What's that? You know, it's the old it's the old stuff, right? It's and the old we, stuff. We, so that's well, we, what we it have is. a developer so, in town who's buying this old stuff and literally taking it, taking this, you know, the, the facade off and everything, taking it to the shell. And he's putting all glass in and fixing it up. And guess what? He's leasing them up. Right. Because it's new, it's hip and it feels good. It's the same as when you walk into a house. Right. I mean, walking into a second generation space versus a spec suite could be the same exact layout. But if it's been lived in for five years, then the landlord hasn't done anything to it. My client's taken the brand new spec suite and all it is is paint and carpet and maybe some new lighting. Right. That's the only difference. But so many landlords don't want to put those dollars out there until they have a tenant for the space. And what ends up happening is they end up sitting there for two or three years vacant. And then that starts to happen more and more as more tenants are rolling. And now you've got a building with no tenants in it. I agree well, with I Dan. The news, I guess the good news, uh, just cut in there, Bill, and I'm going to go with it. The, uh, the good news is we have some really, really well-capitalized investors out there, right? I mean, really well-capitalized. And they're, they, as I think Damien called it, they could play the long game, right? And that's the long game. Yep. I mean, actually, you're saying it's actually a short game in some ways, too, because they're leasing them. Bill, go ahead. Well, the, I agree with Dan. The cost to retrofit common area walkways, outdoor lighting, awnings, paint, the lobby of the building being a vanilla, you know, a, a Navajo white color, that is not expensive. And it attracts tenants. You only usually get to tour tenants one time. And the owners that are doing that are successful. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody scraping? What, like anybody saying, like somebody, you look at it and all of a sudden they just scrape the site? Are you seeing that in your markets? No, not yet in Vegas, but I mean, we're seeing, uh, you know, old retail stuff get converted to call center space, you know, so we're seeing some conversion of space still, especially, you know, there was a big mall here, um, you know, in, in a tougher neighborhood that lost Dillard's and JC Penney's and Macy's. And now it's call centers for Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield and Teletech and all these other companies. Right. And now they have all the amenities for the employees anyways, in the food court of the mall. 
So for them, it's a win-win, cheap space, plenty of amenities, a boatload of parking. We're not seeing anything get scraped just yet. Has anybody seen anything scraped for vertical development in the industrial side in your markets? We had a little bit here a couple of years ago, pre this crazy industrial uh, rage. Um, yeah, just west of the strip. Uh, and I believe it was Prologis that did it. Uh, and then Harsh as well, uh, just bought some stuff and uh, they tore it down. And uh, yeah, they're putting up a new facility. So we have seen that. Again, Vegas is a pretty small valley. You know, while our population is oh, 2.2 yeah. million, from one end of the town to the complete other side, driving is a 30 to 40 minute commute at most. So we're a pretty small valley. You know, Mark, just from a demand standpoint, I'll tell you, you know, if you would have asked anybody over the last 15 or 20 years, hey, how many developers, you know, you know, kind of really control the DFW market on the industrial side, the number was, was less than five. You know, it was really kind of four to five main players that you would think of if you thought about doing something in Dallas. Um, we did a, a count of the developers that are in play today, and there's 75 it's amazing. developers that are now at, tapped into the industrial market. I was talking to a, a group yesterday. They've been always known as the retail group, and, uh, and, and, and they, just, they just made a uh, you know, 90 million plus profit on, on a three-building development that, they, uh, that they're selling here in DFW, and it's one of the first industrial developments they, they've ever done. Um, they've always Mark, been, you know, folks. Yeah. And Mark, one thing I'm seeing is uh, you got to find as a broker, you got to find a way to speed up the process. The whole, everything is moving so fast. Um, we've seen a proliferation in this market of forward sales. And uh, I'm sure everyone has seen those. And, and, and that's where developer puts a lamp piece of property on a contract. He's approached by an investor and the investor basically says, Hey, you get a TCO, you build those three buildings all at once. You get a TCO, temporary uh, occupancy permit. Once you get the TCO, I'll come in and I'll buy them for X amount. And they're having to put up a fat earnest money deposit somewhere 10, 15% at times. And that can be, um, and that, that, that's happening a lot. And that's for, that's for the benefit. Very, uh, hey, good. For the benefit of everyone, what do we call that? Forward sale. Forward sale, forward commit. But I said that. Did I not say that? Sorry about I'm that. I'm sorry, I missed it. Forward if you did. sale. And, and yeah. so it's interesting. And yeah, we developed like. Yeah talked to yesterday said, you know, I didn't give up much money between the standard build a suit and sell and the forward sale. We, we, uh, we literally have, hey, good to that point. I mean, we've got a, we've got a project. We're here in DFW. Um, it's 129,000 foot building, building just delivered over the last month. We've got a, um, we've got a tech company on the West coast who's setting up operations here. They're willing to lease the whole entire building on a 10 year term. Um, this is a billion dollar company. And the developer, the ownership on it, just received an offer and they wasn't much difference in their opinion on how, what their exit would be mm -hmm. um, versus doing our transaction versus just selling it right now as a cold, dark shell with no improvements in it. So, uh, so guess which one they chose. It's amazing. Well, listen, I mean, you're, you're, there's, like we were talking about it, there's an argument to be made that these buildings are worth more empty than they are leased, right? So the, uh, so it used to be the old adage when you did investment uh, investments, it was a leased property. Now rates are rising so quickly that uh, in some ways it's uh, better to, uh, to, to sell an empty building. Second, I know we just went under letter of intent with, I think it was 300,000 square feet, talking to one of our brokers yesterday and it said, okay, well, let's, to your point, hey, good, well, let's get that to lease. Right, because mm -hmm. the letter of intent only means so much. Uh, hopefully, you've got it with a uh, with an honorable landlord. But there are landlords that all of a sudden are now getting what might be. I'm just throwing out a number: a seven dollar rent. Now all of a sudden, get an offer of seven fifty rent next week, and they may mm -hmm. just go with that. So yeah, we got it. We got an update from uh, Mary. Thank you, Mary. It's uh, she said she went on CoStar and uh, found that uh, Apple has sixteen million square feet. So thank you for that. Uh, Michelle, I don't know if you had any other questions in there. I see the uh, thing. I'm not sure, but um, how important a role does this play? Um, oh, there was a question that came in probably for Higgard. Uh, it says some states like South Carolina have extensive training and employee matching services. How important a role does that play in attracting companies? Oh, well, obviously, that's, that's vitally important. South Carolina has always been ranked as one of the top top uh, states in terms of the quality of the, of the training, <clears throat> basically a train the trainer program. 
we bring we you know you, you send over we, we send our people over to germany they learn the process they come back and then they train train the uh possible employees here before the uh the company even arrives so that's a big deal it uh, in this state <clears throat> the governor is uh is, is behind it and it's highly highly ranked yeah damien i i had a question um in your market, you're you're basically saying there's no change. Uh, class A is 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 really hot and still still hot and hasn't had an impact. And how much is uh, people upgrading from your B class to A versus absorption itself in your class A buildings, or is it pretty much half and half? Or and there has to be a, quite a bit of upgrading from B to, to A in that market. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So let me be very clear on that. That's a great question. Um, so what I was referencing is there's very patient money on the class A, double class A product. And so right. they're not in the same situation that some of the B and C folks may be in. And so they're not willing to take the dip in value. So they're figuring out ways to, to continue to take care of their debt service and, 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 and so forth. Um, and, and therefore they have not been wanting to hit, kill their values by dropping their rates. They're doing it other ways. As Dan mentioned, whether it's additional TIs, free rent and so forth. Um, we definitely are seeing a flight to the quality as, as people are seeing all around the country, right? Which is getting out of the, 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 the C and going to the B plus, right? And from, if you're in the B, you're going to the A. Um, so we're definitely, definitely seeing that as well. Um, and I'll give you a real, real life example. So we have a client that we represent globally, um, uh, with 50,000 employees around the globe. And, um, you know, we, we helped them with a big acquisition. We flew over to to, uh, you know, through Dubai, uh, through Chennai and to India and through Bangalore. And, and now prior to COVID, or now that, that now we've gone through COVID, um, we've literally helped them reduce their spend um, by nearly 50%, like 48% over what they were spending annually. Uh, what they were spending annually was in excess of $100 million a year in rent. And What's interesting is if you look at what they're doing now, they've gone to a hub model and everything, nobody has assigned seats in this particular industry. Um, and this isn't good for everybody. Um, but now they want people to work from home. They've cut their, 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 their spend significantly, but now they want people to come in to, to, to actually do something, to actually use the office for what it was you know, really intended, right? It's not just to sit there and, and, file envelopes. Like if you're working on an RFP, you know, get your butt to the office, right? Yep. Um, if you need collaboration and ideas and whiteboarding, like get there and turn it into conference rooms. And so they've got very collaborative space. Really, it's just the CEO and the direct reports to the CEO that have assigned seats and everybody else. So we've subleased, you know, out of six floors, we've subleased three floors to other tenants. Um, and the other three floors we've restacked. And, um, and so that's been, um, but it's great, right? Because it's going to be really dense in those spaces starting January. Um, so, so that's interesting. Yeah, it is. It, Mark, it is an interesting a, term, of, term of art that relates to what Damien was called, was referring to. It's called the side gig. And employees are, right. employers are not uh, wised up to the side gig and they, well, they want people back at the office. <laughs> because of that. Yeah. yeah. yeah that story is unbelievable. It's it just uh, people double dipping. That's yeah. good. I forgot that. I got to remember that one. It's funny when you do these uh, panels, it's uh, great. You learn more than actually you, uh, you, you give. So it's, it's a lot of fun. The, I know the, the side got, gig I is real. You know, I, 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 my, yeah. I told my dad I was going to get a side gig in real estate, you know, and here we are. So <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> great. <laughs> hey, we got one question, which I do want to address before we head out. And I'm going to throw it in. Uh, well, I guess we could throw it in everybody's court. I think, um, you want to read that question there, Michelle? Do you got it sitting there? Can you read it so I don't block my screen? Uh, we'll finish up with this. It's got to be really quick answers, guys. Yeah. Is this, can anyone speak on how ESG fits into within the, these markets for employees and tenant demand? Uh, is it valued more? Uh, and are the tenants paying more rent for it? Um, anybody can, can anybody anybody to answer that one? I'm not a good ESG guy. I can tell you that. I'm, I'm really... Um, behind on that. I obviously know what it is, but anybody dealing with ESG and is that affecting values and that and the sorts? 
we got no's right across the board. It's funny, I think, you know, being at the conferences we've been at, I, I certainly go to ESG is becoming a much more bigger part of the conversation. Uh, and I think people are still trying to get their arms around from a real estate standpoint, what it means. Obviously, everybody knows about lead and all those kind of things. Obviously, this is not exactly like lead. I could tell you lead, I think generally has, um, you know, starting to take, uh, to take uh, you know, um, some uh, traction and, um, and, and they are being recognized uh, as lead building. So we're going to see on ESG. I think it's a great question. It's something we all have to deal with. There was also a question on uh, self-storage. Are you all seeing self-storage boom in your markets? I know we are in New England. Quickly, anybody seeing self-storage strong? And, and we're seeing it. We're seeing yeah. self-storage all over the place. Yes, yeah, they, yeah it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, same it goes back to the consumerism. People have more stuff than they need, so it's just rent a place to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Well, I, I, I'm in the process of moving right now. Let me tell you, I got way sure. more stuff than I need. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all don't think we're about to jump the shark on self storage? You say it again. You don't think we're about to jump the shark on self storage? Yeah, I don't know. Storage? Yeah, I don't know. I've don't heard know. that for a while. Yeah. So listen, we have to wrap up. We have uh, some questions were coming in, but we promised an hour and we're at an hour. We could do this for a long, long time. So I apologize if I rushed some answers, but I'm trying to get, uh, you know what, into a uh, two pound bag or whatever the heck they say it is. So um, I appreciate everybody. <laughs> it's, CRE. It's, hey, Mark, you're referencing a, a Texas quote. It's called putting a 10 pound sausage right, in a five pound casing. That's what Thank you. Saying. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate that clarification. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good ending, Damien. <laughs> it's, not the one, it's not the one I was thinking of, but that's good too. Uh, anyway, well, I, I appreciate, listen, all of you for taking the time. It's, it's, a, it's an effort. I would appreciate you imparting your wisdom on all of us, including me. Uh, Michelle, thank you for driving this with your uh, group over at, uh, you know, Lindsay and Larissa for driving this as well. And SIOR I mean, to a certain extent. You, you did a lot of the driving, Mark. <laughs> yeah. It's always a lot of fun because it's always learning and uh, you know, keep the light, keep the smile on the face and everybody enjoy and uh, let's keep this thing going. Thanks everyone.